be part of the explanation of why spoken language development is lagging behind the child's understanding in other areas of their lives. Two, two possibilities. One, the risk of glue ear, the high incidence of glue reducing really effective hearing for language. And the other one being evidence that the children's short-term memories for verbal information are also um, developing at a step behind their nonverbal understanding. Receptively, they're learning from the environment. They're learning visually, they're learning auditorily. Expressively, when we talk about expressive speech, okay, there's kind of only one way to, to get it out, and that involves coordination of respiration to get the power for speech, phonation, the voice for speech, resonation, whether it's going to sound oral or nasal, articulation, making the sounds of speech, and then combining them, and at the same time encoding the words you want to say, formulating the words that are going to go with it. So expressive language is very, very complicated. Go, ready, go. Go. It's so easy to underestimate him because his verbal skills are so much lower than all of his other abilities. And it isn't until you actually get to know him that you realize just how smart he really is because he's, he really isn't verbally communicative at all. He has little phrases that he says and he can ask basic questions and he'll say one or two word things and yet he can sit on the computer and play with an age-appropriate computer game or he can put together a 35-piece puzzle by himself. You only get this from watching him, not from listening to him, because he really has just such a low verbal ability. My two-year-old expresses himself better than Ethan does. Many parents um, will get very excited about the progress that they may see at two, three, and four. I'd also be a little bit hesitant because some children are making fairly slow steps forward. And so some parents may also feel quite anxious that at a stage where other children's language is coming very rapidly at two and three, their child with Down syndrome, the thing they may be really worrying about is the fact that their spoken language and skills aren't keeping up. So I think it's a stage where, where parents of youngsters with Down syndrome can be quite anxious, particularly about the spoken language progress and they may see more of a boost between four and six in their spoken language than between uh, two and four which would be t the case with with typical children she's actually on a little bit of a uh, an acceleration curve at the moment basically the pattern with isabel is that she she plateaus for a while and it's very hard to see any progress and then all by herself, she suddenly begins to take on a few new words and use them a bit, a bit more strongly. So she's on a little bit of a, a move at the moment, which is good. But we can't, we don't really know what, what causes her to, uh, to progress like that. You know, you know, we've seen the pattern before: a lot of plateaus, a little bit of a spurt. So, um, we're, we're encouraged by it, but it's only one little step. You know, I think fundamentally, Isabel is very slow to develop language, and. We can't really say, you know, there's no great optimism that that's going to change dramatically. When you have an evaluation, the speech pathologist always asks you about the timing of the first word, babbling, how much the child babbled, um, whether the child makes specific sounds. We're very interested in timing and milestones, but really what's it, it's, it's very important to know is the sequence in the milestones and the hierarchy, not the timing of when the child begins to do something. We want to know that the child is progressing. We want to know the child is moving along. But we also want to know that the child is doing that properly, that the child is achieving each milestone, and that the child can build on the milestone before so that they can move ahead. So what we're most interested in knowing is the hierarchy. Often when we give out information on milestones to families, we take off the chronological age and we just keep the sequence and the activity because that's what's really important, that the child is building on a very strong foundation and continuing to progress.
Uh, hearing is very, very important to speech. Typically, developing children learn speech and language from their environment through hearing. If children have a fluctuating hearing loss that typically goes with fluid in the ears, the problem, the difficulty is that sometimes they're hearing it and sometimes they're not hearing it. So making those connections between the word and what it symbolizes or the object or the person or the event and the description becomes more difficult. Also, many of the words that are grammatical words are said much more softly. So we say, I walk down the street, I'm running to catch him. But we don't say, I'm running to catch him or I walk head down the street. Okay, we don't make it louder. It's at the end of the word and it tends to be dropped off. Okay, and so many times plurals are that way, tenses are that way, and many times children have difficulty with it, not only on a grammatical level, but because they really can't hear those final sounds. They're softer. And so often when children with Down syndrome have begun to read, okay, writing them out really helps kids learn that. They can see walked, walked, rather than walked where they don't hear it. The ear canals are and now both the pretty same good size. size. Yeah, they're both pretty good size. It's not like before where I need to take them under the microscope. They've grown, so I can see his eardrums quite well now. Um, uh, and there's no wax in his ears, so I don't have any trouble seeing things. If we look at children from age two to age seven, things change as the children grow. And one of the good things that change is that the ear canals enlarge. We know that approximately 50% of newborns who have Down syndrome have very small ear canals, so small that really the primary care physician cannot see the eardrums. And that requires frequent visits to a specialist, usually an ENT specialist, so that we can examine the ears under a microscope with some very small instruments that we have available. By about age two to three, the ear canals enlarge to the point that it's much easier for the primary care physician to follow the child's ears to rule out persistent middle ear fluid, ear infections. Once the ear canals grow to the point that the ears can be examined, what we suggest is that the ears are checked at least twice a year. Hearing tests should be done a minimum of once a year. If the, if the child is able to do a type of hearing test where the right and left ear are tested separately. And it's, that happens at a different stage in each child. And it seems to go from about two years to maybe six or seven in children with Down syndrome. If the child is not able to do the testing where the ears are tested separately, so you just get a hearing result but it's reflecting both ears at the same time, then you should really be tested every six months. Overall, the number of ear infections may go down as the child gets older, but it's still very important to continue to follow the ears and the hearing very closely. There may not be as many acute ear infections with the high fevers and the ear pain, but there is still a very high incidence of the eustachian tubes not working. So you still have that negative pressure behind the eardrum. You have fluid that may persistently be there. And that's going to affect hearing and speech. It also can cause permanent damage to the eardrums. So it's one of those things that you don't want to lose sight of. It is much safer to put a tube in, a small tube, and have a healthy eardrum that's not being stretched out, that's not getting scarred by the infections, than to have the repeated ear infections, the repeated spontaneous perforations because of ear infections. Uh, you're really saving that, keeping that, you're keeping that eardrum healthy and hopefully saving that child from developing some of the complications of chronic ear disease, which is things like cholesteatomas, which are abnormal skin cysts growing in the ear, uh, erosion of the eardrum or even the middle ear bones from chronic ear infections, that that 10 minute procedure that even though it may need to be repeated several times is a lot safer, it's preventative care from developing much more serious complications. Yeah, we've, we've had children in our clinic 